Hey everyone, Sarah and I are here in Colonial Williamsburg and we're going to check out, get an up close look at the magazine. In the nighttime hour of April 20th, 1775, Lord Dunmore, the last standing royal governor of Colonial Virginia, ordered Royal Marines to remove gunpowder from the powder magazine found in Colonial Williamsburg. The magazine is a place that was robbed by the British. They actually stole all the gunpowder here in Williamsburg. An incident that led to local unrest and further fueled the fire for independence amongst the colonies. 15 barrels, I believe it was, of gunpowder in the nighttime. An event that sparked the beginning of the quest for independence. Our quest for the day would be, first, take you on a quick history flashback lesson to that historical event that took place right here at the Powder Magazine. Then, we'll enter inside the brick perimeter walls of the magazine and get a closer look at one of Colonial Williamsburg's most iconic structures, built in 1715 and still found here at the center of the city. Although we've heard the interior is closed on the day of our visit, we plan to get an up-close look at the exterior of the old structure. We would also see if we could discover any sort of archaeological digs that are currently taking place around Spotswood's old Powderhorn storage building. Then finally, we'd partake in a cannon fire demonstration titled The Necessity of Orderly Battle to learn more about the artillery of the Continental Army in the 18th century and to witness live cannon fire. The Virginia skies on this day were clear with curiosity, and we were looking forward to an exciting day of learning more about just one of Colonial Williamsburg's 89 original restored structures. We're here outside of the magazine. We're gonna walk up here and once and for all, go inside and take a look and show you guys what uh, what's behind the brick wall there of the magazine give you a little bit of insight on what happened here and uh, what it looks like today. So we're headed that way right now. Let's go take a look. During the evening of April 20th, 1775, Lord Dunmore's order to remove the gunpowder from the magazine of Williamsburg by cover of night was taken notice by the townsfolk while the actual heist was taking place. Word quickly spread amongst the city and local militias were notified. With the people raging with anger and ready to storm the governor's palace, the situation escalated but eventually somewhat simmered with Dunmore's promise to return it when needed. Dunmore warned two days later that if he was attacked, he would impose martial law and declare freedom to the slaves and reduce the city of Williamsburg to ashes. A short time later, a 700-man militia that formed in Fredericksburg voted not to march on the city to retrieve the stolen powder. The Hanover County Militia, however, led by Patrick Henry, voted and did march toward Williamsburg to demand retribution for the stolen powder. Henry sent a small company of men to demand payment for the stolen gunpowder. The rest of Henry's militia marched toward Williamsburg and arrived about 15 miles or so outside the city on May 3, 1775. That very day, Lord Dunmore fled Williamsburg for the first time with his family. Due to the events and uproar caused by the powder magazine incident and news of other colony uprisings, Patrick Henry was advised not to enter the city by Carter Braxton, a Patriot member of the House of Burgesses, with Braxton saying he would ride in to negotiate payment for the stolen gunpowder. Payment was given to Patrick Henry of which he promised to deliver to the Virginia delegates at the General Congress. Henry then left to take his place as a member of Virginia's delegation to the Second Continental Congress. Dunmore returned only briefly to Williamsburg, but his relationship with the House of Burgesses and his role over the colony had gravely deteriorated. And on June 8th, he and his family once again fled the city during the evening hours. And here we are at the entrance and it says ticket is required. Of course, we're annual pass holders. Let's walk in and see if we can be a part of the show. Uh, 
Yep, that's what they're trained to. The idea was on the battlefield, they may not be firing always that much. They're staggering their fire a little bit more with their comrades. But the idea is, you get them trained at that point when they're under fire, they'll be able to do that more efficiently. The fact, that's one of the reasons why it's also pre-measured rather than civilian gun, you have a powder horn and measure. You don't have to think, am I putting enough gunpowder in there? Da, da, da. You would think to yourself, tear, pour, pour, ram, shoot. That's all they want you to do, muscle them. And currently right now they're closed for maintenance, but it was inside this building where they would store all the ammunition and gunpowder. It would be sent over from London, over in England, and they'd send some of that here. The building was first ordered to be constructed in 1715 by Governor Alexander Spotswood to house arms and ammunitions for the colony. It has a long history of various recovery efforts and usages. In the 1930s, the powder magazine was restored and now stands as it mostly did back in 1715. But it wasn't until later when Lord Dunmore ordered that the British forces come by night, pulling up to the James River and bringing the uh, a surprise group of men in to make the steel here at the magazine. The upper floor of the magazine was known to be used for storing tents, canteens, cooking and camping supplies, and other light equipment and gear for sending men into battle. The second floor housed weapons like muskets, pistols, carbines, bayonets, and swords. Then the downstairs room had dual purpose, with the front room being used for prepping and maintaining weaponry, and a back room, access from the rear of the building, was where the barrels of gunpowder were stored. And there is a closer look of a cannon. And they do demonstrations here. But you can see it, they have a couple of them parked. So I don't know if another unit gets settled on top of that set of wheels. Well, let's take a walk around the side of it. We can't go in, but we can, I believe, walk around the corner here. Looks like they've got a whole lineup of different cannons. Looked like that one at the front was made of gold plating, perhaps even real gold. Yeah. And there's the door with a giant keyhole and looks like the key is actually lying down there on the, on the ground there which would gain access to inside of the magazine and it looks like this brick is definitely an older brick I know this was rebuilt due to damage and I believe like a fire definitely some age in that brick and it appears as if they may be doing a little bit of an archaeological dig so no telling what they're still finding here after all these years. <clears throat> There's actually a, quite a few dig areas around the magazine itself. Since our trip, some astonishing archaeological discoveries have been made at the magazine. A part of the original foundation of the perimeter wall was uncovered. Also, although first said to have had wooden shingles, the powder magazine is now known to have had clay shingles of about four to five inches in width, found during a recent excavation around the structure. And of course the entire magazine, or what was often referred to as the powder horn, is completely enclosed in this brick wall. So we didn't get to make it inside the magazine, but we actually made it just in time. They're about to do a full on demonstration of cannon fire. So we're gonna go over here and check that out and show you what that looks like. Full on demonstration. Let me welcome you all to our uh, program today, the necessity of order in battle. At these programs, we talk about one of the aspects 
of the uh, Continental Army in the 18th century. Uh, that would be either the infantry, we do that some days when we have enough people here. Sometimes we get to do the cavalry when one of the actor interpreters comes down. And uh, on days like today, we're going to be talking about the artillery. Artillery was actually considered the king of the battlefield uh, back in the 18th century. Uh, Gunpowder artillery was developed in China uh, back around the, in the 1100s. It shows up in Europe about 1327. That's the oldest record we have of a cannon uh, in Europe. It took a while though to get cannons uh, be, to become common. Number one, they were kind of expensive. And number two, the technology to make cannons uh, wasn't stellar, I guess, when they started making cannons. In other words, they had to learn the process. Casting a cannon was casting a pretty big object. Uh, they also had to make some improvements in the gunpowder too. But one of the problems they had once they began using cannons, and I would say they began using cannons pretty extensively in the 1400s, during the 1400s, they had better gunpowder, uh, better casting techniques. But the big problem with cannons in the 1400s was they were heavy, enormously heavy. And consequently, when you would set a cannon up on a battlefield, once the battle started, you could not really move the cannon. You couldn't bring your horses in to move it. So the cannon was pretty much stuck there while your men advanced or retreated, whatever the case may be. Uh, which meant your cannon wasn't going to play an important part of the battle uh, once the battle got underway. That frustrated a lot of commanders. Uh, probably the commander who had frustrated the most was Gustavus Adolphus in the early 1600s. He could not stand the idea that he did, have, he did not have mobile artillery. So he spent about 20 years developing mobile artillery. What he came up with was what was called the light three-pounder. What you're looking at behind me is a light three-pounder. This gun was actually uh, termed a regimental gun by Elvavis. He assigned two of these guns to each of his infantry regiments with the idea that the gun would stay with the regiment. In other words, as the regiment advanced on the battlefield, the gun would be moved forward by the crew on the battlefield. It was light enough it could be moved by the crew and not have to bring in horses. If, the, if your army retreated, the gun could retreat with you. So the gun was operated in, in this sense then, not by artillery crews, but by the infantrymen themselves. They would pick men out of the uh, regiment to operate the gun. Now that requires some training, obviously. So uh, we came up with a process, or they came up with a process of training by what was called parade ground commands. Uh, what's gonna happen now is the gun sergeant will issue individual commands for each step that we do to load that gun, to clean, load, and fire that gun. We're going to demonstrate that for you right now. Uh, I'm going to have them fire around uh, using parade ground commands so you can see the training process that we that they went through to train their infantry their infantrymen. Gun sergeant, if you would, one round by parade ground. He's advancing the worm first. This is to clean out the tube. You notice we did fire the gun, so there's probably some of the previous charge still down the barrel. We want to make sure we get that out of there before we load another charge. Sponge now is going to be a lamb's wool that has been wet. We want to make sure that there's no burning embers in there. And we're also trying to clean out some of the gunpowder fouling. Now the gun is clean, we're ready for the loading command. Handling the charge. Handling the charge, he's bringing the charge forward. The charge is not kept up at the gun, but kept in the back of the gun. Distance. He's now loading the barrel. The man with the sponge on the other end has a rammer. He's ramming the charge down, making sure it's all the way into the breech end of the gun. The man now is picking that charge, he's picking a hole in it, so that when he pours the priming powder in there, that priming powder will hit the gunpowder in the uh, in the charge. The next commands are the firing commands. So if you don't like loud noises, this is the time you want to cover your ears. Take, ready, give, fire. Um, 
One of the interesting things about what we're doing for you today, uh, this is, as I said, a light three pounder. Uh, we are using approximately four ounces of gunpowder in our gun. Uh, by the way, we would probably like to use more, but if we do use more, we get phone calls from all over town where we're rattling windows too much, busting windows uh, because of the concussion. Uh, so we limit our charge to four ounces. In the 18th century, this gun would have typically been loaded with uh, around six to 12 ounces of, uh, of gunpowder, maybe even up to a pound, depending on what they were going to do with it. Keep in mind now, this is a light three pounder. This gun is not intended to do a lot of damage to buildings or ships. It is a uh, anti-personnel gun. It's designed to be used on the battlefield with the regiment to be and shot at the enemy. Now, a lot of people ask, if you're, what are you shooting mostly? Well, usually we're just gonna shoot a solid round ball, a three pound ball. Now, I'm sure that surprises you. Uh, we rate the cannons by the weight of the ball it fires, not the size of the ball. So a light six pounder would fire Guys from the frontier, apparently. What would a light six pounder fire? How, how heavy would the ball be? Six pounds, yeah. Um, one single ball. Now, think about that. If you're firing a ball at a line of men approaching you, how many of those men are you going to hit with that ball? Probably just one or two, right? It's not going to do a lot of damage to the enemy because it doesn't explode. It's just going to pass through a couple guys. Not a lot of damage. Uh, probably the biggest factor using these cannons with the psychological factor. These guns can shoot a lot further than our muskets. When I say a lot, I mean a lot. You could be talking up to 1,500 yards. Uh, with our muskets on the battlefield at the, at the level, you're probably looking at not much more than 100 to maybe 350 yards. So we can start shooting at the enemy uh, well in advance of our musket fire. Uh, and they're gonna be a long way from our lines. The other thing, if you get hit by a three pound cannonball, you're not really gonna be wounded. Uh, it's gonna leave a massive uh, hole in you uh, or remove some of your body. So psychologically, that could be very difficult for the man standing next to you to deal with. So again, a psychological weapon when you're using cannons against infantry soldiers. Now what happens as those enemy soldiers get a little bit closer to you? Let's say within 300 yards of you. Well, we can start loading this gun with what we call case or a canister shot, which is basically a tin can filled with musket balls or a sack filled with musket balls. What's gonna happen now, we don't have much range with these shots, but if they're in range, we're gonna do a lot of damage because we're gonna be firing about 80 musket balls at an enemy line. We could take out 60 or 70 men easily in one, in one firing. Maybe even 80. Yeah, maybe even 80. So uh, there's a number of things that we can fire from these guns. Um, rather than just solid shot, especially on the battlefield. Uh, larger guns, like your 12, your 18-pounders, uh, 24-pounders, 32-pounders, and 42-pounders, would be used on board ships and in ports. Uh, those are the big guns that will start doing damage to both ships and sink a ship or uh, do damage to fortifications. What we're gonna show you now, obviously that takes a little while to do the parade ground commands. We're gonna be firing now with battlefield commands, where we're gonna, uh, a brief or a, a smaller version of those firing commands. What are they loaded with? The rimstock holds two pieces of flow mat, which is back then was a piece of uh, basically hemp cording that was soaked in saltpeter, so it burned with a glow, not a, uh, uh, a flame. Did it last long? Yeah. Uh, a good piece of flow mat will last eight to ten seconds uh, or burn eight to ten inches in one, one hour. Prime, so they don't need to keep relighting that pitchfork. No, right? they, stick in we do they have to it. relight it occasionally during the you know day, uh, but a good piece of slow match should stay lit a couple of hours, at least a couple of hours. Yeah. Cool. I was wondering that because it sort of seems. So does it deal well with like rain or moisture? No. No. If it gets wet, we got to... One is over if yeah, things are wet. Yeah, doesn't work well in the rain, yeah. Rain will dissolve the gun of the saltpeter. Yeah. And if you don't have the saltpeter in your gunpowder, you don't have your oxidizer. Yeah. 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 make it go a little bit quicker with the battlefield, man. I should also tell you, today's demonstration 
bigger boom, and especially if we had a ball in there. And as a matter of fact, you would see the cannon itself recoil uh, a good uh, 10 to 15 feet if we had a, a pretty decent charge in there. Uh, okay. It's not recoiling now because there's no ball in there. All we're Why shooting is powder. In there? Just, a, just a powder charge. Just gunpowder. That's why you don't see holes in the wall. <laughs> they would frown on that, by the way. I thought that would have been strong enough to withstand it. An amazing day of learning spent here at the heart of Colonial Williamsburg walking away with a clearer understanding of the fascinating history that is spread out all across the grounds of this outdoor living history museum that makes up the old colonial capital of Virginia. I find it always never short of simply extraordinary. <laughs>